Thank you, everyone, um, and welcome back. And for you, those of you joining us uh, just for the afternoon, um, I'd like to also begin. Um, we had a uh, welcome and some teachings from Elder Larry Grant this morning, and I'd like to begin again by acknowledging that we are on the traditional, unceded, and ancestral territory of the Musqueam peoples, and welcome to um, the second part of the Idle No More, We Too Are Idle No More uh, session. And this particular panel will be focusing on community engagement, and, this, and the panelists um, will be talking about um, our internal community here at UBC in terms of some of the work um, that is being done for students, staff, faculty, as well as intercultural understanding. And uh, then we'll also be hearing about some of the work um, that is taking place from the School of Community and Regional Planning um, in work in consultation and collaboration with um, Indigenous communities. So let me begin. We have. Um, six panelists and, uh, uh, well, five panelists and then uh, um, Dr. Candice Callison who will be responding to the session. For you, or those of you joining us uh, just for the afternoon, um, I'd like to also begin, um, we had a uh, welcome and some teachings from Elder Larry Grant this morning, and I'd like to begin again by acknowledging that we are on the traditional, unceded, and ancestral territory of the Musqueam peoples, and welcome to um, the second part of the Idle No More, We Too Are Idle No More uh, session. And this particular panel will be focusing on community engagement, and, this, and the panelists um, will be talking about um, our internal community here at UBC in terms of some of the work um, that is being done for students, staff, faculty, as well as intercultural understanding. And uh, then we'll also be hearing about some of the work um, that is taking place from the School of Community and Regional Planning um, in work in consultation and collaboration with um, Indigenous communities. So let me begin. We have. Um, six panelists and, uh, uh, well, five panelists and then uh, um, Dr. Candice Callison who will be responding to the session. And I will introduce each of the panelists individually um, and then they will share their, their session and, and uh, then Dr. Callison will be doing a response at the end. So let me begin by introducing Dr. Leonie Sandercock. Dr. Leonie Sandercock joined a SCARP that is the School of Community and Regional Planning in 2001 after teaching at U UCLA and the University of Melbourne. In 2012, Leone received an honorary doctorate from uh, Roxeld University in Denmark. Her main interest is in working with First Nations peoples through collaborative community planning to decolonize mainstream planning. Leone and Giovanni Attili spent five years working on a documentary called Finding Our Way with two First Nations communities in North Central BC and using the film as a catalyst for dialogue in a deeply divided society. Since 2010, Leone has been working on a new curriculum called Indigenous Community Planning, ICP, with SCARP's master's degree. This curriculum has been designed and is now being delivered in partnership with Musqueam. So welcome, Leone. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm honoured to be here. Um, as, a, as an immigrant of, of 12 years standing and, and now a, a Canadian citizen, I'm, I'm um, eternally grateful for the privilege of, of living in this beautiful part of the world on the unceded ancestral territory of, of, of the Musqueam and Coast Salish peoples. Um, I'd like to talk today about, about insiders, outsiders and, um, and partnerships in community planning. But I'm very excited about the discussion this morning about the missionary position. And I, 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 I want to, I'm going to, I think I'm going to get to that at, at, the, at the end. So it's just to keep you in suspense. Um, uh, as, a, as an Aussie, I have to confess that I'm inching my way out of ignorance um, around indigeneity and indigenous state relations in Canada. I came here naively expecting that things were heaps better in this country than the country I, I grew up in. And I've been um, pretty astonished to discover that they're, they're very much the same with relation to 
uh, the, the state of the indigenous nation. Um, I'd, so I'd like to acknowledge the, my, my mentors who are helping me to, to inch my way out of this ignorance. Beginning with um, Ted Hohola, an elder from the Pueblo Nation, from the Isleta of Pueblo in, in New Mexico, who took me aside 20 years ago when I was talking about the politics of difference and, and uh, uh, pointed out a very large omission in my thinking, which was around the indigenous world. Um, since, since coming to BC, um, I've been very fortunate to, um, to be introduced to the elder, Jerry Allman, who I'm delighted to see is, is here today and who's, who I, I regard as my, my ongoing mentor as, as well as, as co-teacher. Uh, and as Hatej mentioned, um, I, I spent five years working with two carrier nations up in north central BC and the, the elders Corina Lewin and, and Rob Charlie um, were extremely generous in um, introducing me to their worlds. I have a wonderful um, carrier PhD student, Liana Patrick, she co-teaches with, with Jerry Allman and myself and, 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 and allows me to debrief my cultural anxieties with her. Um, and uh, last but definitely not least, my, my, my new partner in crime and, and my mentor from Musqueam, Leona Sparrow, who sometimes gently and more often not so gently um, uh, is mentoring me in, in things Musqueam and how to work in a, in a good way with, with the Musqueam people. Um, so my field, this field that I've been in for 30, 35 years or something, of urban planning, community and, and regional planning, um, is a field with a lot of historical baggage and, and so I feel like I need to kind of start with the dark side of that field and give you a, um, most people don't really know what planning is. Um, my st our students have a hard time explaining to their parents, we, none of us can explain to our taxi drivers what is planning. Here's a, a fairly typical definition, that planning is the formulation, content and implementation of spatial public policies. Now, um, that's not my favoured definition, but it's, it's a standard definition and it immediately tells you a lot, I think. I mean, the spatial public policies, land use. Um, and our school of community and regional planning, we, it, we um, teach a professional master's degree that's accredited by both the Canadian Institute of Planners and the American equivalent. <laughs> And so, we're, so we are deeply implicated in all of the colonial institutions um, of planning that have, have determined that the land use uh, on, this, on this continent, on, on Turtle Island, for the last 400 years, that have so radically changed the land use. So for me, the, like the dark side is, in a way, is the prominent side of planning. And when I read Cole Harris, Making Native Space, I guess I, I, I sort of realised in terms of the history of um, what we now call British Columbia, that the, the beginning of the Western, the practice of Western planning in this part of the world, really, it didn't begin with Harlan Bartholomew's 1929 plan for, for Vancouver. It, it began in the mid 19th century with the colonial administrators who invented the reserve and imposed the reserve system of Indian lands. So for me, like, you know, that's the beginning of my profession, of professional practice on this continent. And, and that's, you know, it's not a very proud beginning because it's a beginning, that, it's a story that begins in, in dispossession. Um, my own preferred, more normative definition of planning is that it's about managing our coexistence um, in the shared spaces of, of human settlements and ecosystems um, for the purposes of, of social, cultural, and environmental justice. Um, but how to, how to reconcile that with the historical reality? Um, so I guess that's sort of why, why and how I'm addressing indigeneity is that um, I've, been, I've been gifted with the, with the privilege of getting to know um, some indigenous communities and just the experience working up in north central BC 
made me turn the gaze back onto myself, what I'm teaching and what we're teaching in the program and to ask how come we're not teaching what's happening, how come we're not teaching the history of dispossession, the history of apartheid. Um, and so three years ago I just set about with the, with the encouragement of a, of, a, of a good leader of our school, Penny Gerstein, um, sort of gave me the opportunity to start thinking about what it, what it would mean to, and I really, I, got, I hate to use the word to decolonize planning because I think it's a bit of an overstatement of what we're, you know, but it's, let's say it's a goal, it's a good ambition. Um, what would that look like? You know, given planning's colonial past, um, how can indigenous community planners um, and non-indigenous planning professionals collaboratively advance an indigenous planning agenda? Um, and what would that, what is an indigenous planning agenda? What, what would that look like? Well, you know, my, my co-teacher here, Jerry Oldman, um, he, when he talks about um, planning, he says, we've been planning since time immemorial. And what does planning mean? And if I may quote you, Jerry, because I think it's so, so, so beautifully simple and beautifully eloquent, you talk about planning as doing no harm doing no harm, like what, what better definition? Doing no harm to the land, doing no harm to one's fellow human beings. Um, and so, if, you know, for me that's pretty much the core definition of what an indigenous planning paradigm would be. Um, it, it, it's holistic, um, it, it's community-based and community-driven, and it's founded, it's founded in, grounded in an indigenous worldview. We have an opportunity, at least in BC, thanks to some historic changes, thanks to the activism of indigenous communities themselves in this province, of pressing, pushing against the model of planning, the top-down model from the Department of Indian Affairs that's been the historic model of planning, and saying we want uh, a community-driven approach, we want holistic approach, we don't want to do this silo planning, one, you know, one decade we've got to do an infrastructure plan, the next decade we've got to do a housing plan, depending on who's in power in Ottawa. Um, and so the regional office of the, of the Department of Indian Affairs, now called ANSI, Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada, um, the regional office has a couple of terrific young women who've been really trying to work with those indigenous communities to come up with funding um, and to, to do capacity building so that um, First Nations within BC can um, produce their own community-driven, community-owned plans um, for realising their own visions of sustainability. And, and, and that's what we're, I guess, trying to, trying to tap into in this, this new curriculum of Indigenous community planning. Um, uh, but I, I, I think, you know, first of all, one of our challenges is to define the, the roles in if, if, if we're going uh, as non-Indigenous planners into Indigenous communities to work, to work with and in support of those communities. Um, so it's, it's an alliance, it's a partnership, but uh, but what are the roles, the, the, the insiders and the outsiders? And that's, that's a little bit of what I, what I want to get to. Um, just to briefly on this, the specifics of this curriculum, we have a two-year master's program, coursework-based master's program, and it's a professional degree. I emphasize that. So we're training professionals, just like the medical school and the law school, um, you know, which automatically means that we're identified with, as I say, colonial institutions and, and so on. Um, the, the Indigenous Community Planning Curriculum is 50% is of, of the master's program. Uh, and I, uh, for me, the, the, the single most important thing about what we're doing is that we're doing it in partnership with Musqueam. Um, that for two years now, we're in a, we're in a formal a partnership that's been um, approved by Chief and Council. Um, but the, before that formal approval, we were, we were working for a year in conversation with, with Musqueam about the content of the program and about um, the extent to which Musqueam would be involved in delivery. Um, so the, the program has, has five core courses. It has an internship with uh, an Indigenous community or organisation and it has a practicum, which is 50% of the student's second year, 
uh, where they're placed in a community. They spend one week of every month in a particular First Nations community. This past year, we've had uh, two students in, in, in Skidigat and Haida Gwaii and two in, in Gitsan Territory. And they work, um, there's a mutual learning agreement drawn up and an ethical agreement drawn up and the students work on some aspect of community planning. It might be at the beginning, it might be at the implementation stage, as determined by the community. So the students are there in support. So the, the overall philosophy of this, of this program, I guess, is first of all, it's, it's about unlearning the colonial cultures of planning. And then some of that starts with the decolonizing the self, which is in some ways, I could spend 15 minutes talking about the challenges I have with that. And, and sort of telling embarrassing stories about myself. But um, and secondly, it's, it's about, about learning an indigenous worldview and methodologies. It's community-based, it's land-based, it's experiential, it's, um, it's partnership-based, it's the intent is to support indigenous communities to achieve their own aspirations for sustainable development. Um, so how can outsider planners um, work alongside First Nations planners without recreating the colonial culture of planning? Um, I'm gonna quote from one of my PhD students who's about to defend her thesis, Aftab Urfan, who's been working with the Gwasala Nahwada for the last four years or so, and um, in a really a, a beautiful partnership relationship with Jesse Hemphill of, of, of Gwasala Nahwada, and they've just written an article, I, I quote, where they talk about that the, the, the indigenous community planner needs to be in charge and responsible for indigenizing the process. And the outsider planner plays an active ally role and is primarily responsible for decolonizing the process. Um, so the premise is that, that non-indigenous planners cannot indigenize planning. Um, but each First Nations community has unique traditions and webs of, of relationship um, and that, that doing Indigenous planning means being in tune with all of that. Um, as non-Indigenous planners, we need to challenge our own tendencies to speak too much, um, to take charge of the situation, uh, or to privilege some bureaucratic reporting, scheduling, requirements that are you know, driven by funders or by the Department of Indian Affairs. So it's about letting go of a lot of inbred habits um, that make us good academics, you know, but, but bad community people. Um, um, so like fundamentally, the non-Indigenous planner is there to support the community in service to the community, and it's, it's an intentional reversal of power relations. So I think what I... What I our students are, are hopefully learning, and it was reflected in here last week when they, when the first four students who've gone through the practicum co-presented with their community partners. And they said things like this, that it's, what we're learning is that this is about a way of being as much as anything. It's not about the technical tricks and the toolkit. The most important thing is this way of being, a way of approaching a community with humility and openness. Um, reversing the gaze back to the settler society and, and, and our institutions. Uh, it's about listening for a long, long, long time before speaking, um, entering with a beginner's mind um, as opposed to the expert mentality, letting go of our own agenda, um, however progressive we might think that is, it's still our agenda. Um, and, and letting emerge in the community what needs to emerge as the community's agenda. Um, continually examining, questioning our own assumptions. Um, committing to capacity building and essentially with the intention of doing ourselves out of a job and of, of creating a new generation of, of, of indigenous community planners. Um, uh, practicing playfulness creativity, relaxing into other ways of knowing and, and doing. For example, like planning is typically, you think of the, out, the, the deliverable of planning as a plan, the master plan, the document, it's 200 pages, it's full of diagrams and incomprehensible, you know, um, uh, statistics and so on, they're in, indigestible documents. What about if the plan is a song or a, you know, a dance or a, or a, a painting? Um, 
I've come to think about planning as a, a therapeutic process, um, that this kind of, um, the attempt to indigenize and decolonize planning, how it can be a part of or a path to healing and reconciliation if it's done in a good way, um, that comprehensive community plans um, can be roadmaps to sustainability, to well-being, good governance. And there are some fantastic results that are already emerging in First Nations communities that have produced their, their community plans, Musqueam being a great example, their, their community plans just been recognised by um, UN Habitat uh, as a sort of best practice for sustainable community development. So the, the term, this idea of partnership or the term, this kind of neutral term, collaborative planning, is, is okay, but to me it doesn't really do justice to the, um, what I think is the potentially transformative nature of this kind of work, which really is about the, the quality of the relationships and the lifelong friendships that, that emerge. Um, and the, the the elder from the Haida community who was in here last Thursday, she said something like, you know, um, nothing really changes until we're working together face to face. Um, so I think that that's um, the, the learning that's, that, that's come from me. Um, my PhD student and I, we, we wrote a poem about this as a journal. I think it's the first poem that's ever been published in a planning journal, a journal of planning theory and practice. And in the poem, we each reflected on what we'd, how we'd been changed by working with First Nations communities. And, and um, can I have 30 seconds to quote this? So, um, 50 and more shared stories of pain and pride, suffering, resilience, and resistance. What did I do to deserve these stories? And what will I do with them? They say I'm different than when I started this project. How could I not be? You, I, cannot be in community without loving attachment. Humble, open-hearted, vulnerable, hopeful, patient, and critical. Listening through silence. Without these and more, I, you, will always be suspect, undeserving of trust. So many gifts bestowed from a depth of not knowing to deep knowing adopted into a web of relations stretching from past to future, lifelong attachment, loving and accountable, there is no end, no final report or summative evaluation, just being in relation. So that summarises my own um, experience and, that, and to get to the punchline about the missionary position and, and, and Marjorie's the thing about the moral high ground, um, made me think, okay, I, I do have a missionary position here. And, and here's what it is. It's, it's that the indigenous planning paradigm is the only path to restoring the health of the planet and of human relations. Our next speaker is Alden Habakon. Um, and I'll just give you a brief uh, intro. I've asked all the um, panelists for uh, their bios, and Alden, I didn't get a chance to connect, so please feel free to add. In 2010, Alden Habakan was appointed the Director of Intercultural Understanding, Strategy Devel and Development for UBC, where he's leading the development and early implementation of the university's commitment to intercultural understanding. His work is focused on embedding diversity and intercultural fluency in organizational cultures and harnessing diversity to achieve strategic goals for social sustainability. Uh, he is also well known for introducing multiculturalism 2.0 and 2.0 or 3.0 um, and Alden is also the founder and publisher of Schema Magazine, an online platform for about the intercultural identities of 1.5 second generation Canadians and the co-founder of the Asian Canadian Journalist Association. And I know in your work um, on CBC, you've also been part of doing some work with indigenous communities as well. So I'll let you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I was invited to um, speak a little bit on the intersection between the university's approach to intercultural understanding and the connection of how and why indigeneity and Aboriginal identity or history and culture is central to that. 
And you can't really see this, but it's a slide of my uh, almost three-year-old son. So, some people uh, tease me that the, the, I use these, these presentations to show pictures of my, of my kid. And I absolutely do. I totally, it's totally an excuse. But it's a reminder for me as to why um, I'm so passionate about this work. I just re was reflecting on this today. This isn't really for me. This is for him. I would love for him to have a familiarity with these issues and this history and this context in the way that I'm familiar with the internet compared to my dad. He just doesn't get the internet. And I just, it just is a part of my life. And, I, and, I, and, and I'd love to think that in 15, 20 years that what we talk about today is a part of his life in a meaningful way um, beyond even my understanding. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the university's uh, uh, commitment to intercultural understanding and just that uh, connection to it. And just beginning with a working definition of what we've developed. Um, this is a quote from the discussion paper from 2009, so this is before me, as to why Professor Toop was even thinking about intercultural understanding. It goes, people who do not know how to recognize, understand, and appreciate cultural difference or how to communicate across cultural and situational boundaries are people who are unable to function effectively in many circumstances and who do not enable and may impede critical work in our societies. Um, in our latest uh, university survey of students, we actually found that only 53, 53 of our students, 53% of our student, students believe that the diversity of their classrooms is enriching their education. 53%, which is kind of sad. So we're, we're working on that. So people ask me all the time what we mean by intercultural understanding, and I often gloss through this and I end up having to come back to it. So I'm just going to read this real quickly. Intercultural understanding refers to the breadth and depth of understanding across profound cultural difference where an individual or a group understands a variety of significant cultural experiences tied to forms of social cultural difference such as ethnicity, race, religion, gender, identity, and expression, physical or mental disability, sexual orientation, socioeconomic class, immigration, and in many cases academic, employment, and professional status. The cultural histories, creative practices, and faith perspectives of various social groups within a society, the interrelations between dominant and non-dominant cultures, the dynamics of difference, and the impact of these factors on power relations. All of this is available. Um, uh, it will be made more available more publicly. We've just released the sixth rewrite of the strategic plan on intercultural understanding uh, and presented that to the Senate a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things that we've been very deliberate about is positioning um, local Aboriginal knowledge as uh, central to this plan. And I'm just going to show you, this is from the statement, um, the kind of pr the inter introductory statement of this uh, plan, and it reads, UBC graduates, faculty, and staff must therefore have intercultural understanding beginning with the depth of understanding in local Aboriginal cultures and issues as well as the self-awareness of one's personal and systemic bias and an openness to difference to contribute to social cohesion and participate in future solutions. That one seems kind of an obvious one. Part of the plan was also doing a little bit of an audit of what our intercultural assets are as a university as a starting point of what we're building upon. And, you know, that's funny because the, the, the plan is called Place and Promise. Um, we often forget how much emphasis we need to really put on place. So one of the assets that we've actually articulated is that UBC Vancouver, the cam Vancouver campus, is located on the traditional, ancestral, and ceded territory of the Musqueam people, surrounded by culturally diverse communities, and situated on and highly connected to the Pacific Rim. This is part of the asset that UBC has, what makes it unique from other universities around the world. And Leone was, uh, gave a great um, uh, example of how uh, the university is actually um, leveraging this to do uh, good in the world. So there are some very practical reasons to why the university felt that Aboriginal engagement or, or Indigenous issues had to be central to intercultural understanding. First, it's, there's some very practical realities around the Place and Promise um, framework. Uh, there are nine mid-level strategic uh, plans, uh, either in development or in implementation. Uh, the first three, you'll recognize student learning, research excellence, community engagement. These are things that all great universities do. Um, the next three, and there's kind of this three groupings of three. The next three are related to achieving the first three. That would be international engagement, alumni engagement, and an astounding work environment. And then there are three that the university has always felt made it unique and something that it felt that if it did, did really well would enable the preceding six 
uh, to, to just a, reach a higher level of excellence. And that would be Aboriginal engagement, sustainability, and intercultural understanding. And it just so happens that Aboriginal engagement and sustainability were the first two commitments that were uh, written and implemented um, many, many years ago. Sustainability, maybe the longest, has been, uh, they've been at that for about 10 years. And so, just from a very practical point of view, intercultural understanding must exist as an extension to all the other eight commitments. It can't be seen as its own thing. It has to uh, find a way of being integrated to the others. And so that's kind of the, 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 the basic framework reason from an institutional point of view. Um, we did a survey of all the possible theories around um, related ideas to intercultural understanding. There's a, there's a long list, multicultural competency, cultural intelligence, intercultural competency, intergroup competencies, intercultural sensitivity training, cultural competency, and cultural safety, which is in nursing. And we landed on something called intercultural fluency. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit about that. And, and, and it, it's just a framework to give us a little bit of language around what it was that students were experiencing in Leone's uh, program. Um, around what they're gaining. Just to make intercultural understanding more concrete, we had to come up with a framework to describe what we want students, faculty, staff, and alumni to actually be getting um, from the university in relation to intercultural understanding. So there are four areas to intercultural understanding that one can develop. Uh, intercultural awareness, uh, intercultural communication skills, uh, cultural literacy, and intercultural capital. And intercultural awareness this is pretty simple. A belief that differences are valuable and that learning are about others who are culturally different is necessary and rewarding. An acceptance of other worldviews and perspectives. Awareness in one's cultural heritage and how it affects their worldview values and assumptions. And so this is something that's very obviously happening uh, in, in programs across the university. And like I said, it's not happening nearly enough. Um, uh, you know, we're surprised by the numbers as to how many students um, actually think that diversity is a good thing uh, as part of their education. One of the things that we know now is that you can't do diversity, human rights work, social justice work, social sustainability work in Canada or in BC and it not touch on indigeneity of Canada because all these things have to do with people and place. And as an example of this, this is a picture of St. John's College. If you've ever had a chance to have a meal there, this is their dining hall. And what they do is they've got flags all up of all the students represented um, that are staying at this college. But they make it a point to remind everyone that you know the, the biggest flag is, in fact, um, this big symbol of Muslim art in the very back. Uh, you can't, you can't have, create a culture of inclusion and internationalization without recognizing that you are, in fact, on someone's land, like it, it's, 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 it's very much connected. So um, it's really hard to, to think about how we do this work, particularly around diversity and cross-cultural anything, and it not bring you to Aboriginal rights, history, and experience at some point. So the other thing, um, the other reason, which is kind of plain and simple, is that Aboriginal people are part of contemporary Canada. And it's funny that I even have to say this, but. There, I have met people in my work that only w know Aboriginal people through the news and uh, through what they see in TV. And they don't believe that Aboriginal people are contemporary part of Canada. They think it's part of Canada's past. Um, so I have to remind them that statistically, uh, Aboriginal communities are the fastest growing Canadian-born populations in Canada, and at one time, um, the fastest growing middle class. Uh, as part of my role at CBC Televisions, I was the manager of diversity initiatives there for six years. My role was to help push newsrooms and independent producers reflect contemporary Canada, and that had to include Aboriginal peoples, especially in uh, um, the urban centers. This is a slide of a, of a conference that we did in 2008 uh, with uh, 40 Aboriginal journalists and um, uh, 20 Aboriginal journalists and 20 journal uh, management at CBC. And it was the first time in CBC's history that its newsroom management ever asked its Aboriginal employees how it should cover Aboriginal issues. The first time. And so it's one of those things where even as an employer, it didn't see its own employees as a resource or as, a, as experts uh, in this field. Um, and this is something I just wanted to uh, kind of, I bring this up when I do presentations about diversity. This was a study done by CBC Sports, uh, a two-year study by this thing called Print Measurement Bureau and uh, Hockey Night in Canada. They were interested in knowing who um, watches Hockey Night in Canada. And if you look at the slide, 
right here, um, I'm not sure what the category white actually means, but 100, 100 is, means it, that's, the, that's the norm, that's the average. So Aboriginal populations are actually watching Hockey Night in Canada above the average. Um, South Asian communities are way above average, and that's one of the reasons why they created Hockey Night in Canada in Punjabi. And we were, we were fighting for some time to actually create Hockey Night in Canada uh, broadcast in Aboriginal languages because there was evidence to show they're more likely to watch hockey than white audiences, you know, and, and when we think about who watches hockey, often everyone assumes that they're white men, and, and it's actually, they're just the average. So the question that I ask uh, um, people who, you know, how many people here know an immigrant family that, like, has just dressed up their entire family in hockey gear to demonstrate they're just so Canadian? Um, I know a lot of, I've seen families like that, and I often ask them, you know, it, does their fanhood of hockey make them more Canadian or more Aboriginal? Right? We don't we really ask that uh, question ever. Um, the other thing that, that comes up around intercultural awareness is that Canadian values like multiculturalism are actually just colonialist interpretations of ideas that were indigenous to this land. Um, um, I ask immigrants that come to Canada all the time, where do you think multiculturalism as an idea came from? They say Europe, I'm like, no. They say the US, absolutely not. Uh, these are ideas here, and we've lost touch of where these ideas have come from, and maybe they've been distorted a little bit. And so often, I think, what, moving forward, we're really wanting to rediscover what, this, uh, what those ideas were about. Um, cultural literacy is another piece of intercultural uh, understanding um, that does deal with uh, how cultures are different in general, but also includes how cultures are different very specifically. This can include history, traditions, values, customs, and resources. Um, not having that uh, knowledge can actually be a big barrier. This is a, s a snapshot from the Aboriginal website for CBC. This took nine years of, of administrative red tape to make happen. Um, before I was hired, it was frozen for four years, and basically the IT department just didn't want to build it. And we had to convince them, and they just didn't understand the history. And what they kept saying was, if we build this, does that mean we have to create an Italian website and a Chinese website? And I was just like, really? So it took us three years in actually outsourcing uh, it. And, and now, you know, it's, it's there. It's integrated into the whole thing, and people respect it. But it's, uh, it's not having the cultural literacy um, prevented them from being able to see the right thing to do. Um, it also includes protocol. And I use this picture as an example. One of the things that I had to learn marrying into a Chinese family was to learn to take these red envelopes with two hands. They're often filled with lots of money. And uh, um, taking it with one hand was very, very disrespectful and could, p could potentially ruin the relationship. And I've thought about how much I've had to learn to be able to build relationships with the Aboriginal communities. There, there is stuff you need to know. Uh, just having a general knowledge often is not necessarily uh, sufficient. So the last bit is intercultural capital, and Leonie touched on this, and I'm so glad that she brought this up. Um, uh, the, to kind of talk about this, uh, I'm going to speak to um, a focus group that I did at UBC Okanagan a couple months ago. Uh, it was a wonderful focus group. We talked about who's most hostile to them, where they feel racism, where they feel prejudice, etc. But I asked them, of all the things that you would want, um, or the main question was, what would you like international students to know about you, your history, your experience, your families, your community, et cetera? What would you want them to graduate from UBC knowing? And they took some time to think about this, and I expected them to come up with this long list of all these items that we should be teaching our international students. And they said, you know what? We'd really just for like, we'd really just, for, for, to, we'd really like for them to just to get to know us. We can teach them all that other stuff. But what we really want is a more meaningful relationships with international students on campus and students in general. And then they started brainstorming how they were going to make that happen, um, you know, as though they were, they were the solution to this uh, uh, and potentially the barrier as well. And so that's kind of the, the, the larger framework. I hope that raises some questions and kind of gives you an uh, idea of how we're trying to position um, this as part of, or how we're trying to position intercultural understanding as an extension of the Aboriginal engagement strategy. Thank you.